Hello, happy Thursday, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, our usual meeting time. Hello, Mr. Midwife. Um, Mr. Midwife is one of my running commentary friends who shows up every week that makes my life much happier when I see him. Uh, him and Scott usually show up. If you don't know about him, he is a, sorry, I should have silenced my computer because he's giving me all kind of alerts, letting me know my middle daughter just got home. Um, yeah, so he has a YouTube channel talking about midwifery. So if you're interested in that, go check him out. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is Bree. I'm an RN, MP, mentor, interview strategist, content creator. I'm a coach, mentor. I've written a book on note writing, um, critical care provider. So all those kind of topics are what we talk about in these lives. And it, this is an opportunity for everybody to kind of engage and ask any questions they have. And I really love having this live interaction with people. Um, people kind of come and go throughout it. So we'll see who shows up and what questions they have. And if not, I have topics set up so that I can monologue just in case no one has questions. And this week, we're going to be talking about mentorship. Um, it coincides with the blog post I wrote on my website this week. So if you're interested in that, please join us. Um, I'll give you a quick little update on my life because I know y'all are dying to know what's going on here. My husband turned 46 years old yesterday, <laughs> 46 years old, which I, we've been laughing because I said that rounds up to 50, <laughs> half a century, my, my dear, that's where we're at. Um, he and I were born 10 days apart. So his birthday is on the 1st of March. Mine is on the 11th of March. Hey, Scott, 46. I know. Um, it flies by. It just goes by so fast. But we laugh because we were born in the same year. So we're both going to be 40. Well, he's already 46. But for 10 days, for 10 glorious days, he's the older man in my life. <laughs> um, he always has handled aging way better than I have. <laughs> That's how it happens when you're a vain person. Um, so that was that. And then yesterday, on top of his birthday, we took our middle daughter, Hannah, to visit colleges. We only made it to one. <laughs> Uh, we went to one near our hometown, Kennesaw State University, for anybody who's in Georgia. This is a like fairly recently developed school. I don't remember it being a school when I was a youngster in college. But anyways, it's really, it's a huge campus. They have like 44,000 students and the buildings are all new and knock on wood. And I try not to say it out loud too much or get too excited. But she, as of right now, she is declaring nursing as her major, which makes me like so, so happy. But Anyways, it's kind of depressing. I mean, it's exciting and depressing. Like, it's so bittersweet. You go through all these phases of raising kids when you're just, like, inundated with all the stuff. <laughs> you know, right now, my youngest one, we're in the phase of sports and activities and driving around all day and missing dinner and that phase of life. But it's been a long time since my older two were in that phase because there's a big difference between my middle and my youngest. So, anyways, it's just... <laughs> Um, it's, it's bittersweet because I love parenting teenagers and here we are at the point where in a year and a half, she won't be living in my house anymore and I'll have two kids not living with me, which makes me so sad. It's weird. I know it's not the typical way for, um, most parents, but it has been my path. Okay. Let me moisturize before we get going. Cause this is a get ready for work thing. And I tend to get on here and share a lot of stuff and then forget to <laughs> put makeup. Um, Okay, poor mama. I know. It's it's really sad. My friends are like, Brianna, teenagers are so stressful. Aren't you like glad to get them out? No, I'm really not. I'm really not because this is kind of the point at which they become like people. I am definitely a better like parent to older kids than I am younger kids. Like when my kids were toddlers, I remember thinking there was something wrong with me because I'm not the kind of mom who like ever wanted to like sit down and organize a craft or play Legos. And, I mean like sitting down with my kids which maybe looking back is a little bit ADD. Maybe it's, you know, have late diagnosed ADD. So maybe that's part of it. But like sitting down and playing a game with my kids was like torture for me. I, it sounds bad even saying it out loud, but it was like, if I did it for 15 minutes, I felt good about myself. And I don't know what's wrong with me. What's wrong with me? Um, yeah. Six kids, two at home every day. is <laughs> Six. Whew. Um, not only is that like fun and exciting and as an older person, when you have grandparents, like, or when you have grandchildren, like you're going to have such a full life and everybody will be there and it makes for fun interaction. But my God, the expense of it, kids aren't cheap. Kids are not cheap, especially when they get to this college phase. Holy mackerel. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so I think first I need to get on. I have some new products to show y'all today. I know y'all are thrilled. I have new products because um, it's my birthday, so I bought some things, right? Um, and I am a sucker. Like TikTok and their insanely brilliant algorithm know that I like to watch middle-aged ladies put on makeup. So um, I'm constantly inundated with ideas for um, new makeup products. Um and my husband got me this thing. This wasn't really a birthday present, but he gave it to me recently. And I mean, I'm not an affiliate for this stuff. Like this is just, I just like to share things that I like. <laughs> this thing is a, what is it called? It's called an ultrasonic cleaner. I don't know if you can, what is it? It's called, it's by Voraya. Voraya. It is the coolest thing ever. I wear retainers at night and this thing, you put it in here with some water and it like does this ultrasonic vibration and it gets all the gunk out that, like, I'm sure I wasn't getting out with just brushing it. It's amazing. I just leave it in here and like turn it on. It makes me feel like a smart house. Do you ever see those TikTok videos of like the, um, is it Korean people or Chinese people who are like, it's just them doing all the smart things in their home and they have everything smart. So it's a little bit much, but that's one that I like. Okay. Um, mentorship. So mentorship, why am I talking about this? Well, um, A couple people had asked me about this and I've seen some stuff recently on some forums that made me just kind of think about it. And I believe that with, in particular, when it comes to nurse practitioners, with the way that our training has shifted into very much an online space, there's, there's less of the one-on-one -on -one interaction. And in particular, some, I mean, some people, some clients who come to me for mentoring, what they're telling me about their program, they have very, very limited interaction with their professors. So not having the right guidance, and I mean, not just not just from an education standpoint, but from a full on support standpoint, from everything from role transition to all of the things that are required in becoming a provider, all the nuanced things that you may not get in good preceptorships, because a lot, let's face it, a lot of people are in preceptorships where they are sitting there shadowing someone and they're not getting really good interactions with people. Um, you need to, this role transition is as much educational as as much as it is anything else. And it's in learning to be a provider, also in how to find a job and what is what is entailed in the type of work you do as an NP, which is very different than nursing, which is something, I mean, I went to a great school and I still don't think I fully appreciated it until I got out there into the world and started trying to get onboarded in a job. And I was like, what? Like all of these kind of things um, on top of just general guidance about where should I go next in life. And for those of us who have a hard time making decisions, going to a person who is where, who's at where you want to be is the best shortcut to get there. Like go to this person who's been through the path that you're fixing to go through to help you like streamline through it. Cause it's hard. It's way, way harder than you think it's going to be. And if you have someone who can tell you like the secrets, the, tri the, the things that they did to make their lives easier, you will avoid a lot of problems. Um, okay. So Mr. Midwife said, seems like some teachers don't want to teach anymore. Makes it difficult to learn. Yeah, exactly. Good afternoon. The 802 Merce. Hello, sir. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, so, and I also, I mean, I think I have mentors in all aspects of my life, personal and professional. I have some that I have paid for that I have sought out, like gone on internet searches or Instagram searches and looked for specific types of experts to teach me and paid them for their time. I'm in some big coaching programs, some of which are perfect fits for me and some of which have not been, they've been kind of a bust. Um, but I also have plenty of people who have been mentors for me just organically that have come into my life, either through work relationships or personal relationships that have inspired me. And for those of us who really, really are having a hard time making big decisions about particularly career stuff, when you find that one person who can help you spin it around and show you objectively the things that you can't see about yourself and your own challenges, it just makes it so simple. And it, it just the burden that is alleviated. Um, I don't know. For me, it's, it's just worth its weight in gold. And I shared a story on um, the blog post that I was going to share here about, let's see, the, the way I opened the post was what is the most insightful thing someone has ever told you, whether it's someone that you paid or someone that just you saw on the street, like what is the most insightful thing that someone ever told you and how it impacted your life? And for me, 
there have been a lot, but for me, the one that I remember the most in particular, because I'm on this platform and I do a lot of mentorship is the nurse that I worked with that was older than me that actually knew my mom from years back um, that happened to be working at the same hospital I was working at when I was in this phase of should I go back to school or not. And I just remember struggling so much with this. I was an older person. I had three kids. I had a husband who traveled for work. You know, I had to think through, well, if it's going to cost this much money, am I going to get return on my investment? How many years do I have left to work in order to pay off this loan in order to make this worthwhile financially? Because while it sounds great academically and in theory, I don't know the reality of it if it's going to pay off. And then, you know, putting my family through this for two years was really, really hard because my love language is acts of service. So asking someone else to bear the burden of all the stuff that needs to be done was, I mean, just the hardest part for me. So, um, I remember telling her, her name is Penny. I remember telling her, um, I, I just remember talking through this at work one day and she was sitting there and she said, well, what is the big deal, Brianna? What is your big hang up about going back to school? And I said, well, the biggest thing for me is the burden of putting my family through this for two years. And her words were, well, Brianna, where do you want to be in two years? Because in two years, you can be in the exact same spot that you're in now, or you can be in a spot where you are making career change and changing the life of your family. It's not going to make a difference. Um, and I just, I just remember think for whatever reason that was so impactful to me, and then I also remember saying to her, well, you know, I've got three girls and they ranged from at that time, I want to say they were like 11 down to four. And I said, you know, for two years, I'm not going to be able to go to things. I'm not going to be at events. I'm not going to be a present mom. It's going to be very, very hard for me to work even PRN and do this with a husband who travels. And she said, well, what do you think will teach your daughters more in the long run? Being present for all the events or showing them modeling the way of how you go through hardships? And that was like, phew, it just blew my mind. Um, and that, that is what sealed the deal for me. I was like, you know what? I, and we stood by this as parents. Um, everything, most things that our kids have gone through, say they got assigned a teacher that everybody knows is the worst teacher in the school. Many of my friends around here would just go to the school and have the kid move to a different classroom. But the way we decided as a family to deal with this was, okay, stuff happens in life. This is just how it is. Luck of the draw. You get stuck with a bad teacher. Here's how you deal with it. And we saw it as an opportunity while our kids were young to teach them how to get through hard things. And that is one of the best pieces of advice I give to new parents everywhere all the time. It's just don't work so hard to make it easy for your kids, but teach your kids how to go through hard times. Um, so that changed the course of my life because at that point in time, I said, all right, we're just going to do this. I got everybody on board in my family. I applied to school, got in and we started. And I remember thinking through those words throughout my course when things were really bad. Okay. What am I teaching my kids right now? What are they seeing in me? Um, and so anyways, I just, I think that when people can offer that kind of objective view of what's going on in your life, it really alleviates so much of that stress of making a difficult decision. So I think mentors are worth their weight in gold, whether you seek them out and pay them or whether they come to you, the universe knows what you need. Um, all right, let me review some comments here. Um, 802 Merce says, I don't know if they don't want to teach. Oh, you're a teacher. Okay. I will say there's more reliance on technology. Clinical experiences aren't what they used to be for sure. For sure. Um, there's just not enough NP clinical preceptors out there for the amount of NP students there are. And so I think that NP preceptors get burned out really quick and they don't want to do it anymore. Um, and there's really not a lot of financial reward for them. It's anyways, we could go through this. I go through this. I feel like every single live we come on here, we talk about how hard it is to be an NP preceptor, but yes, there's, there's not as much support for um, people who are transitioning to becoming a nurse practitioner for sure. Nurse Scott said, I think that something like that, I, said, I think I said something like Mr. Midwife yesterday. Okay. Um, shortage of instructors, partly because of the pay, partly the fact that not everyone is here for darn sure. I mean, it, we don't incentivize people to become teachers. And I mean, this goes to me across the boards, whether you're teaching nursing school or anything. When my kid was in third grade and her teacher would routine, routinely send her home with new information so that she had heard it before she had to teach it, which I was like, what the heck? and I had to teach her. The, she asked me what a decimal was. And I was like, it's like a, it's like a, <laughs> it's a point. It's a, it's a part of a whole, it's a, it's a, 
like, how do you describe that to someone who's, and that is when it occurred to me, like teachers are way underestimated. Like the skill it takes to make someone see the light without spoon feeding it to them. That's hard. That's really hard. Why do we not pay teachers more? I don't care what is your teaching. It's a hard craft. Um, let's see. Merce says, add in the reliance on the DEU model. I don't know what that is, which is fluffed up shadowing experience, DEU. Oh, yeah, shadowing is bad too. Um, Scott says he's going to an MP educational conference in a couple of weeks. I just ordered a t sweatshirt that said, will you be my preceptor? <laughs> Oh my God, that's amazing. It has a QR code to my LinkedIn profile. That, you know what? If I walked by you and saw that, I would absolutely take you as my student just because of the cleverness of that. I love clever marketing and that is amazing. That's awesome. Um, don't make me sweat finding a preceptor now. It's hard. Start your AGA CMP next week. Congratulations. Um, well, depending on where you're at, what region you're in, how much support you get from your school, it may not be that bad. Um, a lot of people around here where I live, most of them are, um, they network a lot within the hospital system. So some people don't have a hard time. They really don't. Also depends on, well, a lot of variables there, but it may not be that bad. Okay. Um, DU is a dedicated educational unit. Huh? What is this? I've never heard of this. A dedicated education. Oh, so like only certain floors in the hospital takes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I mean, I feel like that wouldn't that be a good thing though, because then you get the people that are drawn to work there, the kind of people who like to teach. Interesting. And you teach LPNs and ABNs. That's awesome. My mom taught LPNs. She taught a bridge program for LPNs. Um, I love that. I think that's great. Um, okay, so back to mentorship a little bit. Um, um, okay, so in the article, I talked a little bit about the difference between a coach and a mentor because I think those two terms, to me, they represent two very different people, uh, but they get used interchangeably, and um, I've hired both, <laughs> thinking one was the other, and they're not. So we talked about that a little bit. I should have brought my readers in here, y'all, because, again, 46-year-old eyes, but... Um, Okay, so let's see. The main difference is the methodology and the focus of how they achieve this. So a coach is going to be more, a coach is someone who's, I think about it as like a boxing ring coach. It's someone who's in the boxing ring with you, who's doing what you do, and is who's literally walking you through the process of doing what you're doing on a minute to minute basis. So they are doing heavy, in depth teaching, guiding. Um, they can also be very inspirational, right? What else do you want in a boxing ring? You want a coach who is going to say the right words to you to inspire you to keep giving it your all. So it's a sort of an ongoing kind of relationship and it is very much a focus driven. So um, I have been in some business coaching programs where it's some, some of them are group programs where you go on and you do a zoom um, once a month or once a week or whatever, and you're with other groups and you all kind of feed off of each other and kind of learn what you need to do this week to get where you're trying to go next week. So it's a very like kind of super focused. Um, I've also um, paid for mentors where I, you basically just sit down in a one-on-one -on -one and you're talking through a, a set problem and they're sort of guiding you on big picture. So I see a mentor more as a big picture type of person. So for example, people who come to me for mentoring are typically looking for helping helping making a decision about whether or not they need to leave a toxic workplace, what, whether or not they need to go to school and what they need to go to school for, um, how to find a job. A lot of people come to me about how to find jobs. Um, so big picture kind of things like that. Um, coaching, I do have a coaching program. So the, I have two different coaching platforms that I do. One is tutoring. So it's more about like clinical education focus. So we talk about, um, you know, relevant clinical stuff that week. Um, patients you've had or case scenarios that you need to learn. So it's, it's, it's very, it's almost like a teacher, just sort of less so, less frequent, I guess would be the right word. Um, the other one that I have is, um, it's a, well, it's, I walk along with someone as they go through the process of trying to acquire a new job interview and negotiating pay. So it's um, a little bit more focused and involved than a mentoring session. Um, okay. It depends on how they run the DEO. If they just pair the student with a floor nurse, they more than likely get more of a shadowing versus direct supervision with. 
Yeah, I, I think that this is because a lot of people, particularly if you work in a hospital, um, I mean, there are all different types of teachers out there, right? Particularly people who are trying to teach while they're working. Um, I work with MPs like this too, that, you know, it's time consuming to have to teach a lot. So sometimes they just expect people who are with them to learn by watching them, which is not the ideal way to learn. Um, you have to get in there and do. You have to watch this student who's learning, put it into practice and see what they actually know and don't know. So you can hone in on what needs to be changed, what needs to be improved upon. Um, I was just thinking about this quote that I had written down not long ago as we were talking about this, that's from Richard Bach. Learning is finding out that you already know. Doing is demonstrating that you know it. Teaching is reminding others that they know it just as well as you. So I think that that kind of summarizes that very well. It's sort of just this, like, I can't, I can spoon feed information to someone. I can tell you, you know, if you ask me, well, what do you think about, you know, this x-ray? I can tell you that, but a better way for you to learn it is for you. You tell me what you see when you look at it. What, how exactly are you assessing an x-ray? What are you looking at systematically? And let's talk through what you know already so that I can add in or tweak what you're doing to help get you to the level where I'm at. That, that to me is a preceptorship. That is a clinical rotation. Um, and like for NPs, it is going in there and seeing patients and it sucks on day one. You go in and put your white coat on, like, what am I supposed to do? I walk in there and I just like talk to them. What do I do? <laughs> but that's just how you do it. You can't, you can't really learn well by watching someone else do it. Um, so yeah, yeah. Um, spot on. Yeah. It's a great quote, isn't it? Um, okay. Let me pause for a second, get a sip of water and put on a little bit of makeup. So. 322, making great time today, friends. Great time. Um, okay, so one of the new things I bought is this thing. I love it. It's from China. I don't know what it is. It was one of these like that came across on the the aged beauty influencers that I follow. And she was like, you need a brush to apply the foundation. And I really like it. It's better than the little sponge I got. So that's my new find for the week. Um, okay, so having said that, put the makeup on, Brianna. Put the makeup on. Um, I did get, um, speaking of aging, I did get Botox for the first time, um, a couple weeks ago, first time ever. My, my, uh, physician was like, uh, a Botox version. I was like, is there, I didn't realize this is, you say it like it's a stigma. <laughs> Yes, Botox version here, but I'm definitely a convert now because I have no more resting crow's feet. It's amazing. Just takes off years. And she also told me that many people do Botox like early, early on to prevent wrinkles from forming, which I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's a thing. I don't know. It kind of sounds a little bit salesy to me, but because, you know, why does a 26 year old need Botox? But. I don't know. Maybe if we'd had it around when I was 26, I would have had it too. Um, but I'm definitely a convert. <laughs> One of my friends said, uh, yeah, now this is a, this is expensive, but it is now a line item part of our budget. <laughs> which I love. I love. Like, yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Took like 10 years off. Um, see one, do one, teach one. Yep. Absolutely. I also, one of the joys that I get from teaching, like precepting, is that it like forces me to level up too. Like, cause I tell you, all, not every single day, but at least once a week when I have an NP student with me, they'll ask me something and I'm like, I mean, I don't know, it just is. <laughs> and then I have to really think through like the why of things. Cause like one of my favorite uh, YouTube friends, Joe, the respiratory coach, has a t shirt. His merch says, Why greater than how? Uh, and that is sort of his mantra is that learn, learn the why of what you're doing rather than the how, and the how will come much, much easier, much more, much, much more easily. If you understand and appreciate why you're doing it, what it is that you're doing. And I certainly appreciate that too, because there's a lot of things that we do in nursing and in the provider role too, that we just, we take shortcuts, right? We just learn that this is just how we do it. This is just sort of the, the culture here, the protocol here. This is what the latest evidence says. But if you haven't read the evidence, you don't understand what the evidence means. What does it mean when you say it's evidence-based if you haven't read the evidence, right? It's just, it's just a protocol. 
Um, so trying to always ask why things are the way that they are and to get a deeper understanding of the pathophysiology, then you'll just make a more effective provider. And students will definitely keep you honest in that regard. <laughs> because you, you, you don't want to just say, well, just because it is, just because it is, just trust me, it is, just trust me. It's just not a good way. Um, so it is good for me even though sometimes it's kind of stressful and you're like busy in the middle of a bunch of things and you're like, um, can we save the question to later so I can think through a proper answer? Do so you see how beautiful, look at this. It's just, it's so simple. It's just, it covers everything in a short amount of time and it's very smooth. I really like it. I really like it. Um, on to the contouring. Ask why three times to drill it down on any subject. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, as when I'm writing stuff, whether it's for the book or the blog or whatever, I, I always, always do a lit review before I write it always to make sure that like, you know, that I'm not wrong <laughs> or that I haven't learned it wrong. And what's interesting is that sometimes I'll read, I'll read research or articles or educate myself on something that, you know, I've read this stuff before I've learned this before. But now I understand it in a deeper level in a better way and things click that they didn't click before. I've seen it in practice. I've seen it in reality. And I just understand other, other parts of the body which relate to it. So it just makes it all easier. Bottom line is just never stop learning, friends. Never, never stop learning. Uh, medicine is vast, though. There's always something new to learn. My wife loves it. Um, when you ask her three times <laughs> or she loves the philosophy of it. <laughs> okay, so one of the things I talked about, oh wait, I gotta do one more thing and then I can get back to the topic at hand of mentorship. Um, um, I wrote out the benefits of what you can get from a mentor and I'm, I'm not just talking about maybe what I'll do is I'll go in a little bit of reverse order and talk about where you can find a mentor because I'm not just talking about paid mentorships, which I think is what a lot of people assume is what I'm recommending, which isn't for everybody. Um, you can find a mentor, how to set up your mentorship. Um, no, I'm skipping to the end. Where to find a mentor. The first place I always recommend is in your practice, um, where you work. Clearly, somebody, you're able to vet them better. You can see how they work. Uh, you can see if they're the kind of person you want to learn from. And I also recommend to people that they don't necessarily pick, maybe not the easy choice, maybe not the one that is going to take it easy on you, that you get along with the easiest, but someone who's going to challenge you a little bit. Um, someone who's going to make you question the status quo, not just tell you what you want to hear. A good mentor will not just be there to inspire you and tell you that you're brilliant. Uh, a good mentor is going to make you question the things that you do and why you do them to make you better. Um, um, I heard this from someone else. I think it's a great idea, particularly for my outpatient friends. See if you can find someone. The thing that's hard about outpatient is this. Everybody's off doing their own thing, no matter what kind of clinic you're in. There's very few clinics where people are working side by side. They may be running across each other in the hall as they pass in between patients, but they're working very, very quickly. Heavy client base, a lot of senses, a lot of patients to see. So you may not have time to stop and ask somebody, you know, um, particularly as a new grad, like, hey, what do you think about these labs? What should I do about this thyroid level? You may not have time to do that. So you're just having to like work on the fly. Um, and I heard another MP say this and I love it. Um, she did not feel like she got enough orientation time. So as she started, this imposter syndrome got really bad. Um, and it took her very, very long time to finish her day because she'd have to stop in between patients, look things up, go back. Um, it just made her very much less confident and less efficient. But she didn't really have anyone to like interrupt and ask, you know? So she asked for four hours a week um, and she got paid admin time where she sat down with this person and said, here's like my four or five toughest cases this week. And she reviewed with them the lab she saw, the exam, what her plan was and what she did. And they talked through what they would have done, which I think is absolutely brilliant. 
Because while it may be slower than what you want it to be, if you had someone right there with you, you still are not just getting through and doing things to the best of your ability and possibly not doing it the right way. You're getting active feedback on what you may have done wrong so that next week you won't do that. And while it's going to take you a while to get through all the things, you're still at least going about it in the right way, you know? Um, so I definitely think that that's a fabulous idea and you want to incentivize these people to be your mentor. So if you can ask your director, your boss, whoever pays you to give you paid admin time to do it, they're going to be much more likely to be willing to take time out of their day to do this for you. Um, obviously if your inpatient is a little different, um, you, it may not be, I don't know if you're working for a specialty service where y'all are kind of going into different places of the hospital, you may have to look for a similar kind of arrangement or, um, if you're doing, um, a type of role where you are directly working with another person while you're orienting, you may just have to ask for more time for orientation. I always tell people as you're going into orientation in these kind of roles, know upfront who your primary preceptor is, who the person is that's going to be offering you feedback. And at what points in time during your orientation, are you getting feedback? Because this is the fault, the failing that I see in reality. A lot of time people go in with a really robust amount of orientation time. It could be three months, could be six months in some programs. It's a long time to learn. But if along the way you're not getting constructive criticism, not just, Oh, you're doing great. Like no constructive criticism. What could I have done better in this setting? If you're not getting that, you're not changing and growing. So you're just going to have kind of the same habits, the same ways of treating people, even though you may have different problems that you're seeing each time. So definitely find out who's going to be giving you that kind of feedback. And if you're not getting it, seek it out. What could I have done better in this case? You know, what, what would you have done differently? How would you have done this more effectively? Um, I think those are all beneficial thing, information that you can get from someone who's directly observing what you're doing. Um, so, that's the first one in your practice. The second one is in your circle. Do you have any classmates who've gotten out who have been working longer than you or in the environment that you want to work in? Um, professors, friends. Um, uh, oh, yeah. And then I talk about, you know, offering line item ways they can help. So when you're going to ask someone to be your mentor, you want to make it easy for them. So you want to tell them like line item, that, like, this is what I'm struggling with. This is what I could benefit from. This is how I think you could help me because you're so good at this. Um, like be very, very specific from them what you want from them so that you make the best of use of their time. Um, and then the next place to look for people would be the next outward concentric circle, circle, which would be local, but like non-familiar to you people. And this, my favorite way to do this is by getting on a local Facebook NP group. So I'm in Atlanta. So there's an Atlanta NP group. If you're in Raleigh, you see if there's a Raleigh NP group, get on there, start talking to people, just communicate with others, um, DM people. Hey, you work in the same field I'm in and I really need some help. Would you be willing to meet with me once a week for coffee for an hour? You know, do something to kind of incentivize them to want to help you. But certainly you'd be amazed at how many people are willing to share their expertise because people like to talk about themselves. So you might be amazed at how many people are willing to do this for you. Um, Merce says, my stepdaughter is a newish grad PA. She would echo what you just mentioned about precepting and onboarding. Yeah, it's um, you need to get feedback because <laughs> just a certain amount of time doesn't mean it's going to be well spent time. Um, OK, so we talked about the local Facebook groups. And then the last step would be, of course, looking for online paid mentorships. Um, so, and I, I kind of already talked about this, so maybe I won't talk about this before, but I think, you know, a lot of people have sort of a um, hang up with paying people to be their mentors. And I can certainly appreciate that. I definitely felt that way in the beginning as well until I hired someone to help me with my business. And oh my gosh, the amount of time, stress, energy, and ultimately money they saved me uh, convinced me that it was a good fit for me. It's not a good fit for everyone. I'm not saying it's a good fit for everyone, particularly when we're in school, you know, we don't have a ton of money. But I will tell you, if you're kind of in a rocky place, either in your deciding to go back to school, in school, trying to get a job, you know, training as a new NP, um, ultimately you have to decide what's more important to you. The rocky trajectory, the burden of ownership that you are taking on in doing this role, 
the financial burden, which may come with either staying at work late or not being able to see patients quick enough to make the money you need to make. So all of those things can be significantly improved by speaking with someone who is an expert at doing what you do, who can help you get there, who can shortcut it for you. So it's all a matter of what is important to you and how you want your trajectory to be. Like in building my business, I was told by multiple people, you know, you can do it slow and save money, or you can do it faster and spend money. And what do you want to do? And there have been both I have utilized both strategies in my business. Some things I'm like, this is, I'm not gonna be able to do this. I'm gonna pay someone else to do it. This one, I don't wanna pay someone to do it. So I'm gonna learn how to do it myself. And it's significantly stressful, but that's the trade off, right? Um, so if there's not anyone that you can find in your inner, inner circles, you may have to go to that. Um, and, and that's okay. That's okay. It's all a matter of, of what, what resources you have and what matters to you in your life. Um, so then, talking about how to set up a mentorship. Okay. Let me do a little bit of a little bit of eye stuff before we move on. This is always a tricky spot. So I have to pay a little bit of attention to this one. Um, I kind of already hinted at this, but like when you set it up, you, you want to have as well-defined line item tasks as possible to make it more streamlined for you, uh, especially, well, actually in any mentorship, right? Because in any mentorship relationship, you are asking someone to give you their time and whether you're paying them for their time or whether they are giving you their time, you want to be as mindful of that time and efficient with the time they're giving you as possible. And so if you can spend a little bit of time before you go into it, trying to like objectively, like literally write out on a piece of paper, what the specifics are you're looking for, it'll make it better for you. I can't tell you how many people will come to me and sometimes our very first meeting is really just identifying what it is that they need because they're in such a spot that they can't even, they know things are bad, but they don't know how to verbalize what it is that's bad. And sometimes it's just because they can't, you, you need an outside party to look at it and go, here's what I see happening in your life. And here's what I hear you telling me. Um, so, but if you're able to spend some time reflecting on that and know that going into it, um, Hmm, what color for tonight? I'm thinking, hmm, maybe this one. Okay. And then, so identify your primary objectives. That's the first thing. Um, are you wanting clinic, clinical oversight? Let them know your specific areas of weakness, your ideal learning style. Yes. Yes. Um, I've had a handful of students over the years tell me in the beginning, because usually the first time I meet an NP student, we'll talk about like where they're at in their training, what it is they still need, how they best learn and, and kind of give them a little bit of rundown on how I teach so that we can kind of get to the best fit for both of us. And the best experiences I feel like I've imparted and that people have gotten from me have been when they can tell me what they, how they learn. I had one student who told me, Brianna, I learn by verbalizing. I, I start to retain the information and cement it in my brain by speaking it back to you. So she said, if I get on your nerves, please let me know. But when you teach me something and I'm trying to understand it, I'm going to repeat it back to you. And she did. And it worked very well for her. Um, so and then I had another student who said that she really I, I'm not a big fan of shadowing. Right. So. Typically, even when I have a student on day one, I'm like, all right, you're not shadowing, go find a patient and let's do some stuff. But I did have a patient or a student one time who told me that she she couldn't do that. And she told me the reasons why she couldn't do that. And um, we came up with a workaround for her. Um, she ended up shadowing more than, oh gosh, that was <laughs> this one was not so good, um, more than I typically do. But we kind of tailored it for her. Um, so that it wasn't like 100% shadowing, but it took some of the pressure off of her. She also didn't have a ton of experience as a nurse, and I do believe that is a factor. I really do. Um, hmm. This is kind of interesting today, y'all. Kind of interesting. If y'all have never come in on one of these before, this is, um, I feel like it should be highly entertaining to you <laughs> as far as how the end product comes because multitasking, like, you know, sometimes we do like um, educational topics, like not just 
professional topics. Trying to focus on that and say smart things and put on makeup and be entertaining. Does that make me a triple threat? <laughs> it's a little challenging. Hmm. And then I forget where I put things down at, which is, I'm sure, a joy for y'all to watch. All right, this is the color corrector. Favor. Let me color back over the spot where I messed it up. Mess up. Um, I like the debate. Why this instead of that? What makes it better? Or is it just a personal preference? Uh, oh, you mean between yourself and a student? Is that what you're talking about? I like the debate. Why this instead of that? Oh, when a student asks you that, probably is what you're talking about. Yeah, I think so too. It also helps me to know what they're thinking and what they've heard from me. Because sometimes I think I'm saying one thing, but it's coming out very differently. Either they're hearing it or I'm saying it differently, but the message isn't computing. It happens. It happens a fair amount. Um, okay, and then I do, what else do I do? I do this color. Yeah, get a little brightness to brighten up the night. you think I would be secure enough at this point that I could go in for a night shift and just not wear makeup, but uh, that'll probably never happen. I mean, it's night. Honestly, nobody cares what you look like. They just want you to be there and have like some semblance of brain cells at 4 a.m., which is challenging. I don't know. It looks funny in this. <laughs> looks funny in that camera. Maybe it looks a little funny here, too. Let me see if I can blend this out a little bit more. Yes, the debate. Yeah. Um, and I don't always necessarily see it as a debate more so just that they're truly, I'm questioning some of the status quo of what they've been taught or, or seen in their practice and they need to talk through why it is. Um, okay. One of the other things I suggested in regards to identifying your primary objectives with your mentor. So sometimes people will come to me and it's not necessarily clinical stuff, but it's more relation stuff. So are you struggling to communicate with your patients, your colleagues? Can your mentor share helpful insight about the team members or even just act as a sounding board when you have had a difficult interaction? Um, and I think it is powerful, powerful to have a colleague to vent to after you've had maybe a not so great interaction with a colleague. Um, I think particularly as APPs with physicians, sometimes, you know, sometimes there's words and sometimes there's big feelings and emotions and being able to go to a colleague and say, Hey, I had this interaction with this person. Have you had an interaction? Like, like it's, is it just me? <laughs> is it just me? <laughs> Am I the one that's wrong here? And I think a lot of NPs are not in environments where they have coworkers that they can do that with. And, um, so I do hear that from people too. So again, finding that community of people who are like you, whether it's a membership or a Facebook group or local group, someone that you can kind of vent to basically to find out if what you're feeling is normal. Um, it will help a lot with some of that imposter syndrome that I hear a lot of people talk about. Um, Scott said, nurse Liz told me that when I'm in clinicals to always ask my preceptor why she did not go with a particular differential diagnosis. Also why they chose the one they did. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. It's just having them talk through because sometimes as preceptors, like we just do, we're just going about our job, right? We're doing the things that we're doing and hoping that you're catching on with what we're doing. But sometimes we don't realize we have to verbalize out loud how we came to the conclusions that we came to. So yes, absolutely. Um, okay, eyes, that's enough for the eyes. Um, and then the other thing with setting up a mentorship is determining when and how you will meet. So um, I talked a little bit about an outpatient scenario that I think works great, one to four hour sessions once a week. Um, Oh, okay. And then like, if you're meeting up with a mentor, going back to your primary objectives and letting the mentor know, um, how best to educate you in a short time frame. would you like to review personal cases of the week? Or do you want to go over big picture topics? Like when I'm doing some coaching, we'll pick it. Sometimes we'll do a case study and then I'll do some teaching about that case study. Um, sometimes it'll be, um, a particular organ system or a particular diagnosis or problem. And we'll talk about that. 
Um, it just depends on how best they learn. I mean, I want to, as an educator, as a teacher, teach to the style of the person who's learning. And I think that's what makes for a great teacher. Someone who teaches to the per to the the that is adaptable to the style of the person that's being taught. So if you, as the person receiving that information, can verbalize to them, I learn best by seeing and doing. I learn best by this. Um, this is specifically what I need here. They're going to be able to more streamline in on telling you or teaching you things in the right way. Um, as a nurse, I find myself doing that with the providers I work closely with. Some welcome it, others not. That's for sure. Not everybody wants to answer questions, and some people will see it as you're questioning them, um, and you are, how dare you question their authority? <laughs> but what in reality you want to know is, I just want to understand how your brain works. I want my brain to be your brain, so teach me your ways. Um, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Scott says, after Bree's live stream, we call each other up and gossip about her. Um, what do you and Mr. Midwife say? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Want to share it here publicly? Mm -hmm. I know what you're saying. You're saying that the right side is unequal to the left side. <laughs> That's what you're saying. <laughs> I'm always so grateful that y'all are here. Truly, truly. Y'all make it so entertaining and fun for me. Um, I'm going to try and be on Nurse Liz's live stream tomorrow. I've, I'm a big failure. Faily? Failure? Failure, son trying to come up with a clever word that's not it though because Fridays are hard for me but um I don't know I need to I haven't been on there for a while so I think I'm gonna try and come tomorrow uh we say we love Reese's best oh if we told you it wouldn't really be gossip that's true that's very true um at least you're not like saying it in a place where I'm gonna walk around the corner and hear you saying it because typically if I'm gossiping about someone that's how it happens they literally walk up right behind me because that's the luck that I have um so I guess the lesson is don't gossip <laughs> Or if you do, come sit next to me. What's that from uh, Steel Magnolias? Have y'all seen that movie? Where she's like, if you ain't got nothing nice to say, come sit next to me. <laughs> um, okay, what do I do next? Next is probably going to be, yeah, this one, pencil for the eyes because I don't have enough eyebrows. Big eyebrows are the thing these days. Just kidding. We broke the measures. Uh, y'all are the best. Um, I wouldn't care if you did talk about me. People talk about me. For sure they do. And on TikTok... They let me know exactly what they're talking about. Me about. <laughs> TikTok is one of the most brutal apps ever, I swear, y'all. Um, I haven't been on there in a while because most of what people go on TikTok for me is for um, educational topics. And I've put that on hold in order to finish my book. So hopefully, maybe next, maybe probably not March, maybe April, I'll get back to TikTok. But I also got to steal up my my emotional stamina for for the for the doctors or TikTok. <laughs> it's not just the doctors. It's not. It's everybody. They all, everybody thinks they know more than you and plenty of them do. And some of them are right and some of them aren't, but man, they like to let you know. It's almost like being in a room full of like um, kindergartners. You know, kindergartners are always trying to one up each other. Like they can't just let each other be. It's just like, I got to one up you. Um, although I don't know, I, is China going to like shut down TikTok? <laughs> I don't like to talk politics. I really don't. Cause I'll be honest. Here's my stance on politics. I like to just stick my head in the sand. <laughs> I don't, I don't like it. I don't want to be a part of it. I just, I vote, but I don't like to vote. I think because I, in my family, the family I'm married into are very political and it's just, it's, it's just too divisive. Like, I don't like it. I know what I know. I know the environment that I know well, I stick to my lane and that's what I choose to talk about. Politics, that's not it for me. I also stopped watching the news. <laughs> um, I do know how to do makeup and Brie does a great job. Oh, now you're just flattering me. Now you're just trying to make me feel good because you said you were talking about me. Um, okay, I also got, here's another new product I got this year. This year? This year? Really? This week. Because it's my birthday and when I went to Sephora, they're like, oh, you get a free birthday gift. This thing, Isla, Ilya, Ilya. It's a mascara. It's a little, it's just a little travel size mascara thing, but I like it. I like it a lot. Um... Okay, and what else on mentorship? Ask for feedback as you go along. We talked about that already. So I'm kind of jumping out of order here, but we talked about where to find a mentor. So now we go to the first thing I talked about in the blog, which was why would you want a mentor? Um, 
and how can they specifically help you? So the main things that I see people coming to me for mentorship are, like I said before, phases of indecision um, where you don't have someone maybe in your inner circle that you feel like can give you a better sounding board than just what your family would give. Because, right, if you don't have anybody medical in your family, they don't exactly know what you're taking on. Uh, so it's really good to have a sounding board for someone who is in the arena, um, has some skin in the game and knows what's involved with it. Um, so I have a lot of, a lot of people coming to me about going back to school. Um, plenty about what, what job to hop to next. And some, um, about the situation they're in at work currently. Um, and that's what I get on the mentoring front. On the coaching front, it's more, um, I actually don't have anybody yet in the dream job plan where I walk someone through getting their job, but I do have some uh, tutoring, just one really, but it's going well. Um, but that's the ongoing stuff. Um, okay, and this is another thing that's always stuck with me, something that someone not said to me, but wrote in a book that I find... Um, very insightful. And that is the, the seven habits of highly effective people um, begin with the end in mind. You know, if you know, if you have a good idea where you want to end up, then your trajectory for getting there is going to be much more effective than if you're just like floundering and looking for something else. And my best real world example for this would be the people who are wanting to go back to school to be an NP because they're burnt out at the bedside, um, but they can't really, they can't really um, state for me what the other reasons are. I think being burnt out at the bedside is, is, is a fine reason to want to do something else for sure. I'm, I'm not denying that at all, but if that's the only thing that really is inspiring you to go back to school, I can tell you, you, you are not going to be happy being a nurse practitioner because you don't, get rid of frustrations or problems. You just trade one set for another. So it's a matter of whether or not those frustrations are um, easier to deal with than those at the bedside. I mean, I was certainly frustrated with bedside. That it was certainly uh, an impact in helping me decide to do something different. But there has to be more to it than that. So um, some of what I do is helping people understand what their end is, what their goals are. Why well, don't have Twitter, Insta, and whatever else they have out there? It has created an environment of, yeah, yeah, for sure. There's a lot of people who are not very nice on those. Um, I, it's interesting, though, because to me it's it's very specific to TikTok. I mean, there are some people on these YouTube videos who will leave some comments every now and again, but it's rare. It's really rare. Instagram, I've never, ever, ever once received a nasty comment. Um, but TikTok, it's like every single post, there's at least going to be one, one hater there, which, um, you know, I'm going to tell y'all about a podcast. Uh, if I can, let me, finish this and I'll look at the name of it. It's one, just one podcast episode I want you to go and listen to. And it is my gosh, one of the most powerful interviews I've ever listened to. A friend at work told me about it. Hold on one second. It's about the power of, um, understanding relationships, not just all, not just romantic relationships, all different types of relationships. And, what you're looking for from another person, whether what you're getting from them is validation or um, self-respect and the difference between the two. And this sounds like something not very insightful at all, but let me just tell you, y'all, it is incredibly powerful. It's on the Jay Shetty show, which I think most of y'all know. His show is called um, Something Matters. Hold on. Hold, oh, please. Hold, oh, please. Um I saved the episode because it was so good. He interviews his friend, Humble the Poet, who's a rapper from Canada, I think. On Purpose. That's the name of his show, On Purpose. Um, he's got a lot of really great, inspiring stuff. But sometimes I don't want to listen to a bunch of whole, like, mumbo-jumbo inspirational stuff. Like, I want to do it here and there, but I can't just do it all the time. I just can't. It's too much. Mm, let me see if I can find... 
Hmm. Where would I search for? Okay, yeah. Okay, yes, it is from December 26, 2022. It is episode, does he have numbers? I don't know if his are numbered, but it's okay. So go to the podcast On Purpose with Jay Shetty. It's, it was published on December 26, 2022, and it is entitled Humble the Poet on How to Get Out of Your Own Way to Find Love and Breaking Society's Common Myths About Relationships. So, so, so powerful. Um, and you're going to hear it from the lens of, you know, where you're at in your life. Um, I think some of it is designed clearly for people who are looking for romantic relationships or who are in them and trying to improve them. But a lot of what I heard was relationships with um, coworkers and the public and um, talks about a lot of the things that go wrong in relationships are what it is that you're expecting from this other person and whether it's coming from a place of needing self-validation um, or whether you're already fulfilled. And one of the things he talked about that was so powerful to me was um, he said, when you are in an arena where people are saying things that you don't want to hear about yourself and that are negative, just remember that you could be the juiciest peach out there but for someone who doesn't like peaches, you are not for them. So you are not going to be for everybody. And that was so powerful to me because I think I always said that like TikTok is great. It's been good for my self-esteem. It helps me to grow a thick skin and to realize that I'm not for everybody and not everybody's going to like what I have to say. But I don't think I truly like mm, assimilated that, appreciated that, lived that until I heard that. And now I can live that. Now I can go on TikTok and put whatever I want out there and be like, all right, you know, if it's not for you, that's okay. I have to be okay with that because while it may not be for you, there may be 15 other people on that same post who are getting a lot out of it. So you're not going to be for everybody and that's okay. And that's okay in everything, whether it's a non-relationship like an online situation or whether it's real life or whether it's romantic or work, you're not going to be for everybody. Not everybody I work with likes me. I tell you, they don't. I'm kind of polarizing actually. <laughs> people either love me or hate me usually in like real life. Um, okay. Kiraki, hey, I'm glad you're here today. For my colleagues that are undecided, I tell them to shadow and talk to others in the profession you're considering. You're right. Many think being an NP escapes bedside. And, well, BS and it doesn't. It's true. It's very true. Very, very good advice. Ignore TikTok. Your fan club is here in President. We love you. Oh, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Midwife. You're the bestest. The bestest ever. Um... Hannah wants to let us know that she's at Barnes and Noble studying. She'll come home later. Okay, fine. This is the middle one who's already going to move out already in her mind. I'm sure she's already moved out. Makes me so sad. Um, I have a couple more tips on why you would want a mentor. The imposter syndrome after you've gotten a new job. So you may already be past the point of schooling and even getting past your interview, but now you've started and you're in the place of, oh my God, this is way harder than I thought. Um, I think that if, if somebody tells you they didn't suffer imposter syndrome as a new MP, they are lying. They are lying. I don't think there's a single person out there who has not gotten into this role and been like, oh my gosh, I am not qualified to care for human beings in this role. Why are they letting me do this? Um, it's normal. It's completely normal. It's just that everybody's trajectory that they feel this is going to be different. For some people, it's going to be, pardon me, a couple months. For some people, it's going to be a year or more. And you know, I think that for me, um, part of my imposter syndrome was looking at my colleagues. I was the only new person. I was the only new person that had been hired there in a while that needed the amount of support that I, that I think I needed. So I looked at how they were practicing as in peace had been doing this for years and how I was practicing. And I felt insecure, ineffective and stupid every single day for a long period of time. But me being me and valuing the why over the how, I could not just get through the day by following protocols or doing what we do in our, in our group. And that's if you already know what you do, right? You have to get to the point where you even know, okay, this is what we typically do. So that's one phase. The next phase is, do you know why we do what we do? And for me, I had to stop. I had to stop, pause what I was doing, 
go to the literature, do a little bit of research, even if it was only five, 10 minutes and try and get the best amount of knowledge I could in that time frame to understand why I was doing it before I could then go write that note and execute that plan. And that adds on a huge burden of time to every single day. So for me, it was four months of that where I, I worked eight to eight, eight a.m. to eight p.m. I didn't leave work until 11 o'clock every single shift, every single shift, y'all, because it was so slow because I couldn't just rush through it. I had to learn it the right way. That's just how my brain works. And so I was late every day and I thought, I don't think I should be doing this. And um, I made a video a while ago, a YouTube video, where I talked about the major mistakes I have made in my career, both in school, as a nurse, and as an NP. And I was one of my most favorite videos I've ever made. Ultimately, I ended up taking it down because even though it got a ton of views, um, um, one of my clients is a marketing PR person in her former life. And she said, Brianna, you really need to consider what you're putting out there. And while your intentions are pure in this, someone else will come along. Some lawyer may come along and say, hey, at one point in time, Brie made this mistake 20 years ago and they will use that against you. And I just was so depressed and sad that she was right. And I ended up having to take it down. I think this is so sad and just contributes to this like false presentation in healthcare that you should all be more competent than you really are and that nobody makes mistakes, which is BS. And we all know it because we all work in this arena, but the public clearly doesn't want to know that. <laughs> so anyways, um, I ended up taking it down. But my point in this is this, I've made some major mistakes. Um, I made a really, really big mistake early on as an NP and um, the liability that comes with the decisions you make as a nurse practitioner are, I, I would say a thousand fold heavier than they are as a nurse. And I can't really tell you until you get there and you're doing it, unless you guys are already working in it and you know, and you get it. But when you mess up, you mess up big and it's big, big time. And it is the kind of stuff that derails entire careers where people get out, where people get sued, where people have the burden from the choice that they made that may have led to someone's death. And so they leave the profession altogether. It's huge. It's huge, huge, huge. So I had a big mistake like this on top of the imposter syndrome on top of staying late every day. And I thought I should not be doing this. I should not be doing this. This is a mistake. I need to go do something else. And I didn't, I don't know why I didn't because it was probably, oh gosh, it was a good two weeks before I started being able to sleep again. And then it was probably a good couple of months before I stopped thinking about it all the time. In the end, it just made me stronger and made me better at what I do. But all of this combined to say that some of this stuff, some of this trajectory can be streamlined when you have a mentor to help walk you through that. Someone to say, hey, I've been there. I've done that. This is what I did to change my ways after that or to improve after that. Um, it just, I just, I, I can't tell you how helpful it is. Um, it, it could be career saving in, in many instances. And the other thing that really helped me with imposter syndrome was learning how to write notes. Because before I was just kind of doing the same thing over and over again every day. And I was never like saving work and building upon it. So once I figured out dot phrases, that's when I stopped going home late every day. Um, so y'all know I love dot phrases for that reason. It totally changed my career. Um, that was one thing I did too. Um, and I did that because somebody else I work with told me to do that. Before that, I didn't even really consider it. I mean, I went through the epic training or whatever they show you how to do it, but I didn't really think, I didn't really think through building my own, you know. Um, but the the benefit of building your own rather than using dot phrases that are built into your system already is that if you do it as you're learning something, you're basically creating your own little guideline, your own little cheat sheet of what you've learned and how best you learn. So when you go to that information, it's right there all in one spot. So you get quick at it. Um, and then once you can start going home on time and feel like you're seeing problems you've seen before and the answers are coming easier to you, then the imposter syndrome starts to get better. But if you don't have someone there to tell you that this is just a phase and that it will get better, you might not, you might not stick around for it. Um, that's what I see in reality uh, with a lot of people. Um, I think I've done all I can do to make this better. So I think it's just time for the lip liner.
I think that is all I had on mentorship. Um, oh, I, there were a couple other little tips or reasons I said why you might want to mentor. Many teams lack structured and defined orientation programs or may not even have someone to train you. Um, and having a mentor will have you will give you a dedicated person to help smooth this trajectory. So I kind of already said all that stuff already. Um, so that's kind of all I have on mentorship. I think it's great. I have benefited from mentors greatly in my personal and professional life. I have some that are that have helped me in the real world too. Um, I think they're great. I think they can really offer a lot of support. Um, I have no idea what next week's blog post is going to be, but next week will be something clinical. Does anybody have any requests for what they want to know about? Uh, basically anything inpatient. I can do pretty much anything inpatient. It doesn't have to just be ICU. Well, let me, let me, let me preface that. <laughs> let me preface that. Uh, nothing mommy, babies, or children, and possibly not ER. <laughs> but everything else. I gotcha. I don't know what that is. Um, Kierke says, my preceptor for NP school just taught me to make my own macro for Epic. Mine was blown. She also told me I would cry for the first six months. Yeah, there were some tears. Uh, there were definitely like tears. I tend to cry when I'm frustrated and yeah, when I would leave work and it was so, so tired and it was so late and I had missed so many things and it wasn't getting easier. There were some tears. Um, but not everybody's course is like that. The person they hired for my group before me got two weeks of orientation and she only got two weeks. Granted, she did a ton of hours with her clinicals with them and she had worked at that hospital, but like she just rolled right into it. I don't know. Some people just... Or maybe they just outwardly don't express what's happening on the inside. Uh, no, OB Joanne. Yeah, I don't. I don't think I can do that. Mm -mm. No, there's there's not a lot I know about women's health. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. It's not my. It's not not my field. Not my specialty. It's, it's complicated. Women are complicated. Um, I don't know. I'm gonna think through it. I'm sure I'll get some inspiration tonight at work. Usually, that's where my inspiration comes something bad happens. And then I'm like, Oh, we should talk about this. And there's always something to talk about. Um, let's see last week we did ABG, VBGs and intubation. So I don't know, maybe we'll do something completely different. I'll think through it. Come up with something. Thanks so much for coming everybody. I really appreciate when y'all are here with me to make the time pass while I get ready for work. It's definitely the highlight of my week. Um, and I will see y'all next Thursday. Thanks so much, friends.